Good morning. Welcome to East Martin Christian Reformed Church. If you're a visitor, a special welcome to you, but welcome to everybody. Special day for us, uh, a new beginning. Um, we're the Trinidads. We're certainly here to welcome them this morning. We came up here as elders. Just want to give them a special send-off, pray over them a bit. We're going to have Joel maybe introduce his family himself. I think you guys know him a little bit, but he's going to do that a second. Then we'll, I have a passage to read, and then we'll... Uh, We'll pray over him a minute, so go ahead, Joel. Good morning. Happy Lord's Day, everyone. It's a beautiful day today. It's good to be here. Thank you for uh, welcoming us as one part of your family. Uh, this is my f cute little family. This is JC, letter J and letter C. Um, she has three Filipino names. You don't want to remember those names, but JC is fine. My uh, eldest is uh, Uel, Aletheia. Um, it's, uh, the pronunciation of Uel is in the picture we sent you. It's uh, Uel, Uwan, and Uwen. Uel, Aletheia, Uwan, Carex, and Uwen, Thais. You'll forget them later, so that's fine. You can ask us again next time. But uh, again, thank you for, for having us here. All right, I have a passage here to read to get us going. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What does the worker gain from his toil? I've seen that bur the burden God has laid on men. He has made everything beautiful in its time. So we ask, what time is, what time is it? Yeah, obviously, it's time for the Trinidads to begin their time with us here, and we're blessed by that. Um, so yeah, we don't know what time it is in God's world. Sometimes uh, we wonder, but we definitely know it's an exciting day today where we can celebrate together with Eternity Ads. We look forward for this partnership with them, uh, working with them to build God's kingdom. So we're just going to, as elders, we're going to pray over them this morning, and then we'll get going. So should we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this blessed day. Thank you for this time. We hear your words. We know that all time is in your hands, and you know what time it is. We worry about time. We wonder where we are, why we're here. We know that you have put us here for a purpose. You have brought the Trinidads here together to work with us. We pray that uh, they would be blessed in this work. Give Joel the wisdom, knowledge, strength, everything he needs to be a blessing in his ministry here. Thank you that his family is with him. Bless them all as they get acclimated to our, our community get used to us. I pray that they may be blessed here as well. Be with us as a congregation. Lord, help us to willingly work with them and, and bless them in their ministry and be a ministry together as we, as we witness to each other, learn more about you as we go out in our community to m make a difference and bring people to the truth in you. Thank you that we have a Savior in Christ. We want that Christ to be the center of this church. We pray that we'll always seek you as we make our decisions. Guide us in this day and in this service. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And a beautiful morning to all of us. This is a special day, not because of the Trinidads. This is a special day because Christ is risen, and He is risen indeed. This is a happy Lord's Day because we worship our living God. And so please stand if you are able as God calls us to worship through the reading of His Word. Hear now God's word. 
Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Who can proclaim the mighty acts of the Lord or fully declare His praise? Blessed are they who maintain justice, who constantly do what is right. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Come to my aid when you save them, that I may enjoy the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may share in the joy of your nation and join your inheritance and in giving praise. Bless us the reading of God's word. Let us sing songs of praise to God. Join me in prayer. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day here at East Marin. And most especially, we thank you, Father, for this is the Lord's day where we can enjoy the freedom that we have in this country to gather around your word with your wonderful people, people who have been redeemed from the slave market of sin and has been transferred from death to life from darkness into light. And may the light of your gospel, which is revealed in your word, expressed in our singing, in our pray, prayer that we pray, be a comfort to your people today, to your glory, and for Jesus' sake. Amen. God greets us through the reading of his word. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take some time to greet one another.
we now read God's law from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. And we read God's law first in the light of its first use, as God's law was intended, intended to reveal God's perfect character. And we know that before our holy God, we are condemned. But we also read God's law in its third use, which is the rule of our faith, because Christ has lived the perfect life we cannot live and died the death we should have died. He fulfilled the law, so we don't need to fulfill the law to be saved, but we live according to the law as redeemed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So hear now God's word. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Bless us the reading of God's law. Join me in prayer. Our holy and merciful God, we confess our sinfulness. We confess our shortcomings and our offenses against you. We acknowledge, Lord, that you alone know how often we have sinned against you when we, when we grieve the Spirit who is in us, when we do not bear the fruit of the Spirit, when we do not reflect the power of the Spirit in and through our word and deed, when we wander away from the ways of the Spirit, when we waste the gifts of the Spirit, and so we pray, Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us of our sins, and Father, help us to live in the light of the Spirit and walk in the ways of the Spirit. We thank you for the assurance that we have in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mercies on you every morning, and your love endures forever. We thank you for forgiving us of our sins, and we thank you for giving us the privilege, even though sinful as we are, we can approach your throne of grace in prayer. And so we pray now and give you our thanks and gratitude for all the blessings that you have showered upon us and upon this church and upon this community. We thank you for the good weather. We thank you for this summer. And thank you for you have supplied rain for our crops to grow in just enough humidity. We thank you for the livestock and we thank you for our vocations. We thank you for these, me these means to work and provide for the needs of our family. And we bring you back all the praises and the glory because we do not deserve your goodness, but we enjoy them through your son, Jesus Christ. We also praise you for your faithfulness to Dennis and uh, Linda on their marriage and their family as they celebrate their 53rd anniversary this week. Continue to, uh, continue to make them a blessing to you and to your church and to their family as they continue to strive to love one another and be good witnesses of your love and in your faithfulness. We also thank you for Bob and the success of the removal of the port give him full recovery and sustain him as he continues to live to your glory we also remember father those who are sick and weak among us be merciful to them father be with them in times of, of pain and loneliness and even in times of frustrations uh, may you give them patience and give them faith to continue to wait upon you in this season of their lives may you use your congregation to be a blessing to them and to be an encouragement to them as well. We pray for those who are battling with uh, cancer. We pray that you be merciful to them. Please heal them, Father. And may you 
strengthen those who are still going through treatments and surgeries. And we pray that they will be successful and helpful in their recovery. We pray for their families as they journey with them in this difficult time. And we pray the same thing for those who are under special care and specific care because of sickness and weaknesses of the bodies. We pray for the medications and the procedures and the medical staff to be beneficial uh, for them, Lord. May you help them even though in this season of their lives they, there are a lot of troubles and a lot of trials. We pray that you help them to worship you wherever they are right now. We also remember uh, Ben and all the 66 guys in their marine company who are going to South America for training. Father, keep them safe and healthy. Keep them from harm and may you be with them. And we pray that you also be with Jonah wherever he is right now. May your hands be upon those who serve uh, this country. We pray for those who have lost a loved one recently and are grieving and are still struggling with loneliness. Father, be their company. Be their joy in times of sorrows. And may you be their peace in times of troubles. And may you comfort them in, in times of distress. Be with them in their loneliness. And may you use your church to be an encouragement to them. Father, we thank you for the summer is almost over. And we pray for the school year 2024-2025. Thank you for another year of teaching for for our teachers and learning for our students. May you sustain all of them. May we also pray for us parents and guardians as we strive to work with the schools and all for the good of our children and to your glory. We pray that you give everyone good health and God-glorifying uh, school season. We thank you, Father, because you hear our prayers. We have the assurance that you will do that which is in accordance with your will and your holy counsel. We pray that you bless our time together even as we open your word and meditate upon your precepts. May your word exalt your son, Jesus Christ. May it edify those of us who are weary and tired and are discouraged. And may your gospel be proclaimed. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let us now worship God through the giving of our tithes and offering. I invite the deacons to come up and help receive the offering. We now worship our God through the listening of His Word. Today we will be starting a sermon series in Romans chapter 8. And 
This morning, we will start with the first verse. So open your Bibles with me in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, page 1,756 in your pew Bibles. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Hear now God's word. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. We'll be reading until verse 4. Verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in, in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, as we open your holy word this morning, what we know not teach us, what we have not give us, and what we are not make us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me ask you a, a very important question. What shakes the assurance of your faith? What shakes the assurance of your faith? Is it a particular habitual sin that you find hard to overcome? And that even though you know in your heart of hearts that you love God, but you just keep falling into the same trap? Is it when you compare your lack of commitment to God and His church, you know, with other people around you who are just saints in their faithfulness to the Lord? What shakes the assurance of your faith? Is it the lack of the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Is it the lack of knowledge of the confessions that you profess, you believe? What shakes the assurance of your faith? Is it the difficulty to forgive those who have hurt you and have left painful scars on your heart and soul that will last a lifetime and you just find it hard to forgive? And you know you are to forgive does that shake your assurance? Is it the guilt that you feel for the loneliness in your heart and the lack of will to live on and the lack of joy because you have lost a loved one, whether from sickness or from irreconcilable conflict? Is the weakness of your faith robbing you of your assurance? Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the gospel. The weakest of faith clings to the strongest Savior. And that is our assurance. Christ is our assurance and not our weak hearts and consciences. That's the good news. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Apostle Paul exclaimed in Romans chapter 7, verse 25. There is a sure salvation and no condemnation in Christ. We have assurance not because of the strength of our faith, but because, of Je because Jesus is mighty to save. Jesus is able to sustain, and Jesus will see us through in every season of our lives. And so this morning, let us establish the immediate context of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, by looking at the previous chapter. So if you can turn with me to chapter 7 in your Bibles, let me read verse 6. 
it says here, but now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written, written code. That's key. It says, but now we are released from the law. And the Apostle Paul was not saying here that the law is no longer needed. We do not believe that. But it was a contrast between our former life, being heirs of Adam and slaves to sin, and now into our new life, being heirs of Christ and children of God. Now, if you continue reading from verse 7, especially verses 14 to 23. Let me read verse 7, then we'll jump to verses 14 to 23 in chapter 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. Let me jump to verses 14 to 23. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, but what I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature, for I have desired to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do, no, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep, I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Verse 21 so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in, in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. Paul said, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. We see here that even though we were released from the law and now can use the law to walk in the spirit, there is still the conflict between the flesh and the spiritual. Our final salvation awaits us in our glorification when our bodies are changed into indestructible bodies now we must admit brothers and sisters in christ our struggle with sin often robs us of our assurance right we ask am i really saved this is the same conclusion that the apostle paul had in chapter 7 verse 24 wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of death even apostles such as paul which arguably is one of the best missionaries we've ever had he wrestled with assurance because he struggled with sin as we also struggle with multitudes of sin but the good news here in this passage is that the apostle found his assurance and in verse 25 he said who will deliver me from this body of death he asked he gives the answer in the following verse verse 25 thanks be to god through jesus christ our lord then comes our text in chapter 8 verse 1 after that section therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Our assurance is founded and grounded in this overarching truth that we find in the book of Romans. And this theme is in Christ. In Christ. There is 
now no condemnation in Christ. Now, did you know that the Apostle Paul used this language of in Christ 140 plus times in all of his books? 140 plus times. Now, why is that important? Because it tells us that the theology of Paul was centered on the believer's union with Christ. Now, the topic of the union with Christ encompasses, encompasses all of our Christian life from beginning to end and could be really well served and studied by itself uh, some other time in the future. But practically speaking, what union with Christ teaches us today is that our faith is not just a set of doctrines that we believe. Our faith is centered in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are known not primarily by our confession, but more importantly, by our communion with Christ. We are known not primarily by our confession, but more importantly, by our communion with Christ. And this also tells us that the assurance of hope we have in life and death is not through our performer, performance and the lack thereof. But as our catechism tells us, our only comfort in life and in death is that we are not our own, but belong body and soul to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So Christ is the foundation of our salvation. Christ is the fuel even of our sanctification, and Christ is the future. And we can say that, that Christ is the foundation, the fuel, and the future of East Martin and what God has entrusted us to do. And in our text this morning, it is interesting, interesting that Paul started this doctrine pack chapter with the image of condemnation. Isn't that interesting? And how being united with Christ saves us from it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this makes sense because in the grand scheme of things, the gospel is good news because outside of Christ, what's left for us is the wrath and the judgment of God. Therefore, being united with Christ gives us assurance that we are not condemned anymore by the wrath and justice of God. Now, the word condemnation is a judicial term. And the image is the courtroom. You and I are guilty sinners standing before a holy judge. And now backtracking to Romans chapter 8 where it says, But God demonstrated his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, paints a picture of Christ paying the penalty on our behalf, on, the be on behalf of the guilty. So when Paul said, no condemnation for those who are in, in Christ Jesus or in Christ, he was saying that there is no condemnation because Christ has already paid the penalty. And that is why we call it the penal substitution. Penal substitution simply means that he died the debt we should have died, and he paid the debt we could not pay. He died the death we should have died and paid the debt we could not pay. So our union with Christ is not just all about the benefits we have received and now enjoy as Christians, right? But first and foremost, it is also about not receiving the wrath and the judgment of God that we deserve as sinners. The gospel finds its climax in the resurrection of Christ. This is true. In the resurrection of Christ, we are assured of our resurrection from the dead. And this is also true. But this assurance is also made possible. This assurance is only made possible not with our union with Christ, not only with our union with Christ in his resurrection, but first and foremost, his union with us in his incarnation, becoming like us in this fallen and broken body, and in his death by receiving undeservingly the punishment of sin 
we fully deserve. This is the gospel. The gospel is penal. P-E-N-A-L. Therefore, it implies, first, the Father made His Son to be sin, who knew no sin, that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Our union with Christ unto life was preceded by His union with us in our sin and death. God had forsaken His Son first, so we can be accepted as his children. God abandoned his son first so we can be found. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. God gave up his son to die first so we can receive life. Christ chose to be lonely and isolated on his way to Calvary's cross first so we could have fellowship with his Father and dine in the heavenly places. There is therefore now no condemnation for you and me because Christ has drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath first. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17. And so Paul exclaimed, and we exclaim with Paul, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as the prophet Isaiah prophesied, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Our union with Christ is not just our enjoyment of the benefits that we have in him but it is the acknowledgement that he lived the perfect life we could not live, suffered the suffering we should have suffered, and died the death we should have died. This is all God's. God saved us from himself, through himself, and for himself. That's the gospel. God saved us from His wrath through His Son who received fully His wrath that is for us. And He saved us for His glory. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have assurance because the condemnation we so deserve was poured out unto Christ. We all need to be reminded of our assurance in Christ. We need to always remember that we have assurance in our identity as people united with Christ. But here's the good news. It is more than just remembering of that truth that secures that assurance. It's not in our remembering of our identity in Christ that gives us the greatest assurance. Because our memory fails us, right? It will, it will fail us sooner or later. We know this. We experience this when we have a loved one who suffers from Alzheimer's and dementia, right? When memories became vague, when they cannot remember even their own family. And we might ask, how can someone who have lost important de details of their life story, who have forgotten important truths about their faith how can they retain their identity as a child of God or how can they remember the assurance that they have in Christ and here is the gospel for you and me our assurance is not ultimately in how we remember but how God never forgets God remembers he is our covenant keeping God and we are who we are children of God and we have what we have our assurance in that identity because in Christ God remembers Christ's redemptive work through his life and death is the objective evidence of our assurance and not our weekly hearts and doubting consciences 
the Apostle Paul could not be more emphatic than this. In the original language, Romans chapter 8, 1 starts with a no, an emphatic no. In our NIV translation, it says, therefore, there is now no. So in English version, it is the fifth word, the word no. In, in other translations, it's the same thing. But in the original language, it starts with a no. No condemnation. Who starts their sentence with a no? Moms? Oh, that's a, that's a powerful word right there. When my kids come to me and ask for go-guards, I will ask them, what did your mom say? She said no. And that's your answer. She's the Lord of the house. I cannot do anything about it. Paul started the first with no. That's a negative word. And the next word in the original language, the next word is condemnation. Katakrime, crime, condemnation. No condemnation, two negatives. No condemnation, two negatives. Right? Who starts their sentence with two negatives? Wives. <laughs> when I ask my wife, you know, how much more do you need to uh, fix the laundry? There's a difference when he said, not a lot, when he said, never ending. <laughs> it's too negative, speaks a lot. And that's basically the picture here. It's an exaggeration. No condemnation. Two negatives to affirm a positive truth. It's a lot powerful than saying, yes, we have assurance. No condemnation. No, none. No condemnation. Can you think of something? Can you think of that one thing that really shakes your assurance? Oh, I've done it again. I've done this silly, petty sin again. This struggle with lust. This struggle with pride. This struggle with unforgiveness. No. That will not take away your assurance. There is no condemnation. This assurance is not only from present condemnation, but from future perdition. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 could be translated as God the Father saying, I will most certainly never, ever cast you out because of my son, Jesus. I will never cast you out. And so, brothers and sisters in Christ, lay hold of this assurance when Satan accuses us because of our sins and shortcomings as God's children and as brother and or sister to one another. And this should be a lens that we also use to see one another. Right? We can never say that person is, is in danger. Not sure if that person is really a Christian or not, but I don't know. Stop it. No. We have assurance in Christ, and if that person is saved, then God will come after that person, whether that will be a wayward kid or a grandkid or a friend or a spouse. Continue laying hold of that assurance that we have in Christ. And continue to pray for the for those who are wandering away. Lay hold of this assurance when Satan accuses us because of our sins and shortcomings as God's children. Because no matter no matter how reformed you know we think we are, and no matter how firmly we profess with Jonah, salvation is of the Lord. No matter how grounded we are, at the end of the day, we are weak vessels. Prone to wonder and prone to leave the God we love. And so at times when our hearts condemn us, God and His love are greater than our hearts. At times when we feel that the enemy is accusing us of our guilt, remember these words, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Living our Christian life in the light of our assurance leads to two things. 
two practical things, humility and confidence. Humility because Jesus paid it all. Confidence because Jesus paid it all. The hymn goes, I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Humility and confidence because of the finished work of Christ. On the other hand, if our lives are not shaped by this gospel, there are counterparts of humility and confidence. And it's pride and despair. Pride tells us that we are better than others. Pride tells us that nothing shakes our assurance. Now, for me, to be honest, and it's a you know, wonderful first day that you know my weakness, I'm scared of flying. I don't like flying. When we flew from the Philippines to San Francisco two years ago, I did not sleep 24 hours before the flight because I want to sleep during the flight. Guess what happened? I was awake all throughout the flight from Metro Manila to Japan to Japan to San Francisco. And my family were sound asleep. That was... And you know, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to tell you that I want to stick around and stay here in the U.S. to go further into studies. That's not the whole truth. I don't want to fly again go, to go back to the Philippines. But that shakes my assurance. I still remember last summer internship in Minneapolis. After the internship, we flew to San Francisco to a Filipino church there. And I still remember praying a ridiculous prayer on that takeoff. I said, Lord, I know I'm saved. But just in case this plane crashes, I just want to ask for forgiveness again. And that's after learning all those Greek and Hebrew languages. You know, no amount of biblical languages will save you from shaking your assurance of faith. Believe me. Pride. Pride tells us we do not need assurance because we are doing good. And sometimes we think we are good by comparing ourselves to others. Right? Pride even tells us that we do not need a savior, that we do not need a sanctifier. Pride is the enemy of the gospel. Pride is the enemy of God. This is a powerful picture of someone who thinks he has assurance, but actually not. Pride can also take the form of despair, right? Despair tells us that we will never be as good as others. We will never be as holy as them. Despair tells us that we can never approach God's throne of grace to receive blessings because of our sins, our shortcomings. Despair tells us that we do not deserve assurance. Despair tells us that we do not know the confessions in the catechism and that's why we're not spiritual. Right? Despair tells us not to, to try running to the city of refuge, who is Jesus Christ, but instead keep hiding and rotting in shame because of our sinfulness. Despair tells us that we can never be enough. But Jesus said to his disciples, whoever come to me, I will never cast out. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, one of our all-time favorite books in our family, commented on these words of Jesus, whoever come to me, I will never cast out. He said that Christians tend to deflect Christ's assurance. You tend, you tend to deflect the objective assurance that we have in Christ because of our shortcomings. And you say, no, wait, you don't understand, Jesus. I've really messed up in all kinds of ways. But Jesus says to you, I know. <laughs> I know. You say, you know most of it, sure, certainly more than what others see, but there's perversity down inside me that is hidden from everyone. But Jesus says to you, I know it all. You say, well, the thing is, it isn't just my past, it's my present too. 
But Jesus says to you, I understand. You say, but I don't know if I can break free of this anytime soon. But Jesus says to you, that's the only kind of person I'm here to help. You say, the burden is heavy and heavier all the time. You don't understand my struggle with sin. It's hard. But Jesus says to you, then let me carry it. You say, it's too much to bear. But Jesus says to you, not for me. You say, you don't get it, Jesus. My offenses aren't directed toward others. They're against you. But Jesus says to you, then I am the one most suited to forgive them. And you say, but the more of the ugliness in me you discover, the sooner you'll get fed up with me. But Jesus says to you, whoever comes to me, I will never come cast out. This for sure is a message for all of us who are here this morning, whether you have been saved all your life or you're just new to the faith. Whether you have recent spiritual renewals or it has been a stagnant spiritual life for a while. Whether you are expected, whether you are excited moving forward or more pessimistic because of what's going on in your life and around you. We all in one way, shape or form deflect this assurance because of our shortcomings. Tonight, we will also start a three-part sermon series in our evening service on Isaiah chapter 4. And the first message will surely give more substance to our message this morning as we shall see by the example of the Israelites, despite their being hard-headed, stiff-necked people, God was actively pursuing them. And so this is also a message for those who are losing a hope for a loved one, a kid, a grandkid, or a friend who have gone astray away from the Lord, they are never and they will never ever be out of God's reach. Be encouraged because our God is mighty to save. Let me end our message this morning by reading a hymn written by John Newton entitled, Approach My Soul, Thy, The Mercy Seat. He said, bow down beneath a load of sin by Satan sorely pressed, by war without and fears within, I come to thee for rest. Be thou my shield and hiding place that sheltered near thy side. I may my fears accuse her face and tell him thou hast died. Praise be to God. If you are here this morning and you haven't Receive that assurance in Christ, that salvation that you need for the forgiveness of your sins. Come to Christ. He's gentle and lowly, and he will never cast you out. Let's pray. Our God, amidst all the discouragements and difficulties and dangers and distress and securities and lack of assurance, and darkness of this mortal life, may you grant us faith and assurance so we may depend upon your mercy and on this, and on this hope build our faith as on a sure foundation. We praise you for there is now no condemnation for us who are united with your son Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. May you help us to continue to abide in you. Help us to celebrate your goodness and your loving kindness in our lives. Help us to grow in our communion with you. Help us to overcome our struggles. We ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Stand if you are able as we sing a song of response in Christ alone.
God dismisses us with his blessing through the reading of his word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.